Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is transplant rejection. Now, this may seem like a very specialized or niche topic. Most of you watching this video will not go on to become transplant surgeons, although many of you will take care of patients who have had uh, organ transplants. But I think the value in this video really is in uh, understanding the pathophysiology of transplant rejection to provide a clinical context and really cement the foundation to understand uh, how the immune system works. So with that in mind, I will begin by discussing the mechanisms of transplant uh, rejection. Uh, and next I will compare and contrast hyperacute, acute cellular, acute antibody mediated, and chronic rejection. Now this will be focusing primarily on solid organ transplants. I will finish up with a brief discussion of hematopoietic stem cell transplants. So with that introduction, there are two types of transplant for us to consider. Solid organ, uh, and the most common of these will be kidney, heart, liver, and lung, with kidney by far uh, outnumbering the others. And then hematopoietic stem cell transplants. These are used to treat hematologic malignancies, uh, bone marrow failure uh, syndromes, and inherited marrow disorders. So in transplant rejection, what we have is T cells as well as antibodies produced against uh, graft antigens that react against and destroy tissue grafts. And the reason they do this is because we are taking a foreign tissue and putting it into our recipient. The recipient and the graft will differ in their HLA alleles. Uh, and even if we work very carefully to uh, maximize uh, the um, correlation uh, between uh, the HLAs, there are a lot of different antigens that we don't measure for that can have an additive uh, and subtle effect. So the recipient's uh, antibodies will recognize graft antigens, uh, though they do need T cell support to really fully manifest uh, their, their power. Now the recipient T cells uh, will also recognize graft antigens, and this can either be antigens directly presented by the graft itself, so the donor uh, antigen, antigen presenting cells, or indirectly as their own antigen presenting cells uh, will uh, present uh, the graft antigens. Uh, so this direct presentation is thought to lead to our cytotoxic T lymphocyte rejection, uh, whereas this indirect recipient uh, antigen presenting cell presentation is thought to account for chronic rejection. More on that later. But with this uh, activation, we're going to get activation of CD8 positive T cells that will become our cytotoxic T cells and activation of our CD4 positive T cells uh, that will be elaborating cytokines. Now, T cells are very good at recognizing foreign antigens and even better at recognizing the foreign antigens in implanted tissue, even better than what you see with pathogens. So because of the uh, B and T cell uh, response, we're going to need powerful immunosuppression to re uh, prevent rejection. So these are the four uh, types of rejection we see on solid organs, hyperacute, acute cellular, acute antibody, mediated, and chronic. And these three have a similar mechanism. The mechanism on this one is different. So what we see in hyperacute rejection is that there are preformed antibodies that are going to deposit on the endothelium, uh, causing activation of complement, leading to thrombosis, inflammation, and loss of the graft. In acute cellular rejection, we're going to have CD8 positive T cells destroying the graft cells, CD4 positive T cells secreting cytokines leading to inflammation. This will combine to cause uh, graft failure uh, without treatment. And then with acute antibody mediated, also referred to as humoral uh, rejection, we get antibodies that bind to endothelium, activate complement leading to inflammation. So it's really the same mechanism as what we see in hyperacute, it's just that the time frame is different. And I'll show you a uh, table uh, that will help you compare and contrast. And then finally, what we see in chronic rejection is arteriolosclerosis, uh, thought to be due to T cell cytokines and antibody deposition. So let's look at this table. This comes from uh, Robin's Essential Pathology First Edition. Uh, I think it's a really nice compare and contrast. This comes from a case uh, based on a renal transplant, so you'll see a reference here uh, to glomeruli. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is a very nice uh, table. So as we look at this, the time of onset after transplantation and the pathogenesis. I'm actually going to work through uh, each of these uh, individually, uh, but you may want to refer back to this uh, for your studies. So let's begin with what we see in hyperacute rejection, which occurs within minutes of the graft being uh, tagged. Attached, uh, to the vascular system of the host. 
Uh, and what we see is uh, that um, when the uh, organ is uh, attached to the blood supply, instead of plumping up and becoming pink as the blood flows into it, it's going to become dusky and swollen and edematous. And very quickly, we're going to get the development of hemorrhage and necrosis. What causes this? What we see is, is that we have preformed antibodies. So the uh, recipient is already primed to attack this foreign tissue. It doesn't need time to develop it. It is already ready. And we can see this uh, most dramatically with an ABO uh, mismatch or also with an HLA mismatch. Or it can be uh, something more subtle due to um, perhaps multiple uh, previous pregnancies in which antigens are built up against paternal antigens. Uh, antibodies are built up against paternal antigens, or we can see it if we have a previous organ transplant, so perhaps a kidney uh, uh, transplant that has failed and needs to be replaced, or even if someone has just had multiple blood transfusions. Uh, now, this is very uncommon. We have a lot of uh, mechanisms, mechanisms that we use to minimize uh, this uh, sort of uh, incompatibility. So this accounts for less than 0.5% of transplant cases. Now what happens is, is when the, uh, the vasculature is connected and blood uh, flows into that organ, uh, the recipient's blood has these antibodies that are going to recognize alloantigens on the endothelium of that new blood vessel, that, that donor blood vessel. And uh, with the attachment uh, of these antibodies uh, to this antigen, we're then going to get complement activation, which is going to attack this endothelium. You can see it's become this dusky color here. Uh, and this will lead to uh, inflammation. We've brought in some additional uh, neutrophils here, and we can get very uh, rapid thrombosis. So let's see what happens. Uh, here we can see a compare and contrast. This is a healthy kidney. Uh, and by comparison, you can see this example of hyperacute rejection. This is probably due to an ABO incompatibility. And you can see it's very swollen. Uh, it's, it's turgid. You can see that it's, uh, it's, it doesn't have the normal uh, kidney markings. Uh, it's also very mottled in appearance. Uh, so we have dark areas here, almost black. These are areas of hemorrhage. We have pale areas here, uh, which are areas uh, of uh, necrosis. And uh, basically, if the surgeon attaches the vasculature and sees this happening, uh, the uh, organ needs to be removed immediately. Uh, this is what we see on cut section. Again, a compare and contrast, healthy kidney uh, and hyperacute rejection. Uh, and you can see here, again, look how swollen this kidney is and it's glistening because there's so much edema fluid. This is because we have this acute inflammation and as you know, with acute inflammation, we're going to get immediate uh, edema. You can see here these areas of hemorrhage and then uh, other areas which are very pale. Uh, and this is because they're not receiving uh, their blood flow. So why aren't they receiving blood flow? Well, let's take a look here at a section of a glomerulus uh, from a hyperacute rejection uh, in the kidney. And you can see that the capillaries, instead of having discrete red cells that are flowing through and transporting oxygen, have been glommed sh uh, shut uh, with this, uh, this dissolution of our red cells. We've got the deposition of fibrin thrombi, which we can recognize as this uh, sort of uh, light pink uh, amorphous material. Uh, we have uh, some scattered neutrophils uh, here, here as well. So basically, this is in the process of acutely dying and no blood is flowing through. And what we can see over time is that we're basically going to get uh, hemorrhagic necrosis of the entire organ. You can see blood is uh, just flown freely here and uh, we have necrosis with loss of our nuclei. So as I mentioned, fortunately, this is very uncommon. Now, what uh, is more common will be acute cellular and acute humoral rejection. Uh, and what we see in this is that we have activated host T cells that will attack uh, the graft HLA and foreign peptides. And this typically occurs within six months of transplant. You don't get acute cellular rejection, uh, for example, three years later, with one exception. So that is that if uh, a patient has had uh, a graft for several years and is doing well, the uh, clinician may wish to slightly decrease the immunosuppression. So we'll try to wean it to the lowest level possible because that is best for the patient. It reduces uh, the uh, risk of, uh, of uh, infections, uh, of opportunistic infections. Uh, so if you uh, have a patient who has uh, been tapering, they can get acute cellular rejection even if it's been three, five years after that uh, organ was transplanted. 
Uh, and so what we will see here is that we will have our CD8 positive T cells that are recognizing uh, these uh, parenchymal cells and will directly kill them. But we can also get our CD4 positive uh, T cells that are responding to uh, the antigen presenting cell, which is uh, indirectly presenting graft antigen. So we would be thinking about this perhaps uh, as our, uh, our direct presentation our indirect presentation, these are the host APCs picking up the graft antigens. We're going to recruit macrophages and neutrophils. These two will be attacking the parenchymal cells and will get parenchymal cell damage and interstitial inflammation. Now, depending on the study, uh, some say that about a quarter of the time this occurs concurrently with antibody-mediated rejection, acute humoral rejection, which we'll talk about next. Other studies say that pretty much all the time that you see acute cellular rejection, there's also uh, humoral rejection going on at the same time. And from a clinical point of view, at this point in time, it doesn't matter. As soon as we recognize that acute rejection is occurring, uh, First, uh, probably by recognizing uh, changes in renal function based on laboratory values, then based on uh, a renal biopsy. As soon as we see that, we're going to increase our immunosuppression. Uh, and we don't, at this point, have separate pharmacologic agents where we say, ah, this is acute cellular rejection, give this medication. Ah, this is acute humoral rejection, give that medication. And that may uh, evolve over time. So what do we see morphologically? This is actually somewhat tricky uh, to diagnose, which is why we have renal pathologists. Uh, and what you can see here uh, is, uh, this is a PAS stain, so we're highlighting our basement membrane here. And you can see this one with this very thickened and wavy basement membrane. This is a tubule that is under attack uh, and is uh, collapsing. And we can compare that to a healthy tubule right next to it. You'll also appreciate that there's an increased cellularity here. This is due to uh, these increased inflammatory cells, uh, which you can also appreciate in the interstitium, so it's slightly more cellular. Uh, I say you can appreciate it. I think it's very challenging. I'm a bone and soft tissue pathologist, so uh, I don't think anyone would expect you to be able to look at something like this and say, ah, oh, that's acute cellular rejection. Now, I think here, uh, this again is subtle, but a little bit more obvious. Uh, you can see here we have a blood vessel. Here's our uh, flat endothelial lining cells. And you can notice there's just too many cells here. What we have is some uh, mononuclear cells here that are separating uh, the endothelial layer here from the vessel wall. So they are uh, invading here and attacking. So this brings us to the next type of acute rejection, which is antibody-mediated or humoral. And again, this is the same mechanism that we see uh, in uh, hyperacute rejection uh, with the same sensitization from multiple transfusions, uh, previous pregnancies, prior transplants, where again, we get uh, an alloreactive uh, antibody that's going to bind uh, to an antigen here on the endothelial cell. Uh, we're going to get complement activation and in inflammation. And the difference really uh, is between the dose of the antibodies. So when you have a large uh, um, concentration of anti uh, antibodies that are specific, we're going to get hyperacute. If we have small amounts we're going to, uh, that develop over time, we'll get uh, um, acute uh, rejection. Uh, so again, we're going to get this, uh, this inflammation. What do we see histologically? Uh, again, this is very subtle. Uh, what we see here actually is uh, inflammation of the capillaries. So here we can see these uh, capillaries. Here's another one. I can really identify them for you mostly because there are little arrows. This is a very subtle uh, distinction uh, that I think is best appreciated by renal pathologists. Uh, but what can help us out is we know that in humor rejection, we are getting the deposition of antibodies with uh, activation of complement. So we can actually use immunohistochemical stains for uh, complement components such as C4D. And what you can see here is very nicely all of this endothelium is, is lit up by this C4D uh, antibody. So we know that we are getting a lot of uh, complement deposition. That tells me we have humor rejection going on. Now this brings us uh, to the last type of rejection, which is chronic rejection, which is a very different mechanism because it is a chronic inflammatory reaction uh, in the vessel wall. And this uh, reaction is going to cause intimal uh, smooth muscle proliferation, like we can see here. And over time, we're going to get uh, occlusion of this vessel, and that's going to lead uh, to downstream ischemia and graft failure. 
Uh, so how does this happen? And the mechanism isn't as clear as what we know for uh, acute rejection or hyperacute rejection. Uh, so uh, the belief is, is that we have our CD4 positive T cells that are um, uh, elaborating cytokines uh, that are going to uh, stimulate uh, the vascular smooth muscle cell to proliferate. We also have a contribution through uh, antibody, uh, antibody binding to endothelial antigens. Uh, these cytokines are going to stimulate additional cells like our macrophages, and this is going to cause this um, smooth muscle proliferation. Now, one of the challenges with chronic rejection, which is actually uh, now becoming the most common cause of graft failure, uh, is that we really don't have good pharmacologic agents to treat this. Uh, by contrast, we do have uh, good pharmacologic uh, agents to treat uh, acute uh, rejection, uh, but with this, it's just relentlessly progressive. So uh, what does it look like? This is a beautiful example here of a heart uh, that was transplanted. You can see here we have our epicardial vessels, and these two veins are completely patent, uh, but this artery uh, is uh, really uh, narrowed by this uh, proliferation, uh, this intimal proliferation. The uh, lumen is now this pinpoint area here. And what we see histologically, this is uh, from the kidney, uh, is that we have the smooth muscle proliferation. You can see that this is so occlusive, there's just this slit-like uh, lumen left. This is uh, something like what we would see in, uh, in very severe atherosclerosis. Uh, and then uh, this image as well sort of uh, highlights what the consequences of this are, which is that we can see here, this is a trichrome stain of the kidney. Uh, trichrome is going to uh, highlight fibrosis in blue. So you can see that with this uh, downstream ischemia, uh, we've got scarring here, abundant uh, collagen deposition. We have some uh, inflammation here as well. Uh, but you can appreciate here again, look at the uh, narrowing uh, of this vessel wall with this intimal hyperplasia. So how do we improve graft survival? Uh, what we can do is HLA matching. Uh, this will help us with our acute, uh, our acute rejection. Uh, and this is really the focus when we think about uh, kidney transplants. When we look at other organs such as heart, lungs, and liver, uh, anatomic constraints as well as the urgency of the need uh, are a bit higher. Uh, for kidneys, we have a backup plan, which is dialysis, but uh, if you put in a heart and it fails, that can be disastrous, uh, catastrophic for the patient, similar with the liver and the lungs. Uh, we also will uh, immunosuppress our patients, uh, and of course this has uh, significant challenges. Uh, the patient will be at increased susceptibility to infection. We can get reactivation of uh, latent viruses such as cytomegalovirus and polyomavirus, and we also can get an increase in our virus-induced malignancies such as Epstein-Barr virus-associated lymphomas and human papillomavirus-associated squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn briefly to hematopoietic stem cell transplants. What we do for this is we're going to take stem cells from the peripheral blood or from an umbilical cord blood uh, uh, um, donation, and we're going to destroy the recipient's bone marrow with radiation or chemotherapy. And by doing that, we're providing the architecture and the niche for these stem cells to engraft. Now, the big challenge with hematopoietic stem cell transplants is graft versus host disease, or GVHD. Now, we've knocked out all of the immune cells uh, in the recipient, but we're going to be putting immunologically competent cells from uh, the donor. And so it can either be uh, these cells or their precursors that are going to recognize the recipient's antigens and attack. Uh, so we have two types of GVHD. We have acute GVHD, which occurs uh, within days to weeks uh, of the transplant. And what happens is, is we get this attack and it causes epithelial necrosis. Uh, so we can see a skin rash. Uh, we can see jaundice due to an attack of the bile ducts. Uh, we can see bloody diarrhea due to an attack on the gastrointestinal mucosa. Now we can also get chronic GVHD, which can either develop right after our acute GVHD or just arise insidiously. And here what we see is this chronic effect so that we're going to have uh, more scarring. So the uh, cutaneous injury that we'll see will be similar to what we see in systemic sclerosis with that uh, deposition of fibrosis uh, in the skin and atrophy of the appendages. Uh, we can get uh, chronic liver disease with cholestatic jaundice uh, and uh, the effect on the GI tract can be, for example, esophageal strictures.
So how do we prevent this? Uh, one possibility is to deplete the T cells in what we are engrafting, uh, but there are some downsides to that as well because by depleting our T cells, we're going to reduce uh, the ability of that donated uh, immunologically competent cells to attack uh, the malignant cells for a tumor. So we get increased tumor recurrence. We also get increased graft failure and increased uh, risk of Epstein-Barr virus-related uh, B-cell lymphoma. So as always, here are a few questions for you to review what I've gone over uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, and as always, thank you very much for your time and attention.